Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's really fantastic that you're able to join us um, at short notice. Um, my name's Anna Taylor. I'm the executive director of the Food Foundation. And this is the first in a, a new Food Foundation series, which we're calling Quick Bite. And uh, what we're trying to achieve with this is really kind of rapid commentary and discussion about new events that are happening in food when they're hot off the press um, to give people an easy way of uh, getting a quick overview of what something's about um, and a chance to sort of form their own ideas about, about the development. So thank you all very much for coming. We're, we're really very much learning as we go with this idea and um, would greatly value your um, feedback in the in the comments. If you find it useful, please do let us know. If you think something else would be better, please do let us know. Um, we're keen to get your feedback, so use the chat along those lines, please. Um, so today we are talking about the government food strategy, which uh, landed uh, in the public domain this morning. Um, and I'm really delighted that um, Professor Sir Charles Godfrey has um, agreed to have this conversation with me about, so we have a chance to reflect a little bit on what's in the strategy and pick out some highlights and lowlights. Um, uh, and uh, I, we're going to keep this to half an hour, so it's going to be short and sweet. Um, Charles um, doesn't uh, really need... Um, a formal introduction because many of you will, will know who he is, but he leads the Oxford Martin School um, at, uh, at Oxford University and we're also incredibly lucky that he's a Food Foundation trustee, a founding Food Foundation trustee in fact. Um, so thank you Charles so much for joining us. I'm going to give uh, just a tiny bit of background context to, so that everybody starts on the same page. Um, the government uh, requested, commissioned um, an independent review on the national food strategy. Um, and the work for that began in earnest in early 2019. Uh, it, through the course of that process, and it was led by Henry Dimbleby, who was the lead independent reviewer, um, and produced two reports, uh, one in, in July 2020, and the main report in July 2021, the one in July 2020 was very much a reaction to the specific context around Brexit and the pandemic that were occurring at that time. Uh, the government was um, expected to respond within six months with a white paper. Uh, that took a little longer. And so uh, now in June, so 11 months later, we've, we've had the paper that's been produced today, which doesn't actually appear to be a white paper now. Um, that's quite important around the question of legislation because a white paper would normally set out an area for legislation. Um, though it doesn't entirely close the door on, on legislation within the text of it. Um, we can discuss a little bit about what happens next in conversation, but I want to jump straight in um, and ask Charles, tell me Charles, what you think about it in a nutshell? And then I'll give you my take. Oh, Charles, you're on mute. Well, I'm glad I'm the first person to do that <laughs> uh, when muted. I mean, as with all these things, there is some good stuff in it. Um, and there are many areas where I wish that uh, the government had gone further. Um, I find it sort of not so much a strategy as a list of what the government is doing at the moment, plus one or two new things, which I think we'll talk about later. Uh, so in a nutshell, I think it's a step along the road to a strategy, but far from a strategy itself. Yeah, I think you're right. It reads a little bit more like a, a narrative. And I think many of the commitments in there at the moment don't feel immediately actionable. Um, I mean, maybe we can come on and talk about that in, in a moment. I mean, I think from my perspective, the, the big question, which I think is facing the government today, which is really how do we ensure that everybody can access a nutritious diet that doesn't damage the planet? Um, 
uh, is is to some extent dodged or at least kicked down the road to the health disparities white paper. Um, and so while, you know, there's this nice sort of um, a bit of language in the goal section, there are a set of goals near the beginning of the paper, which talks about trying to increase the proportion of healthy food which is sold, which is a good idea and is a, is a worthy goal. Um, there's really nothing in there that would help to, well, that starts the journey of trying to work out how you can incentivize the food system and the food industry in a direction that would deliver that outcome. Um, so, I mean, so let's, let's go on and, and, and have a little think about how it aligns with the independent review itself. Obviously, that was the precursor to this. What do you, what's your view on that? And I guess the way I think about the contents of the report is in terms of uh, three parts. One is support for the food industry itself. And uh, we do need to have a, a food industry that is efficient, that works well. Um, and it is going through a period of crisis at the moment, all the way from farming through the uh, uh, food services uh, uh, sector. And then on the health side and then on the environment side. I think that there are some really quite sensible things that are in it to help the uh, food sector, especially around uh, visas for uh, external workers. Uh, I was disappointed that there wasn't more clarity around what future uh, trade deals might look, look like. I, I think that there is a, in some ways it's quite a timid document in that it steers clear of some of the political hot potatoes. Um, we, in the environment, um, I thought there were one or two really quite good things in it. So uh, a number of bodies, and in fact, a report I'm just involved with, the Royal Society was going to recommend it as well, um, were going to recommend a national land use framework, and that was in the, uh, in the food strategy as well. And the government, who have been saying for the last couple of years that they don't need it, have now acknowledged that they, will, that they do need it. Um, I accused of, of being a bit timid in one area where I think they've not been timid is that they have talked about the um, free compartment model and how that might be a useful prism within which to see some of the environment, the, the multiple cause, uh, multiple um, things we want to do with our land and how we can actually get them to, uh, to, to join up. Um, I think, if anything, and Anna, this is your much more your area than mine, the, the area where it's most disappointing is around health and obesity. And I guess that's partly because um, when the Prime Minister came out of hospital and said some really quite um, brave things about uh, the need to act on obesity, uh, I know my colleagues in the, in the health world were really encouraged by this. And I think there has been a really quite substantial rowing back on that. I think that can be explained by the political dynamics that we can see at Westminster at the moment, but it, it, it is a disappointment. There is a lot of work, uh, a lot of talk about investing in research about what works. And of course, as an academic, I'm never going to say that's a bad idea, but um, we know an awful lot about what can be done at the moment. And we should and we should do that. Um, the final point I'd make is, is that the document is a little unclear about whether it is responding to the crisis we're seeing right at the moment and likely to see over the next 12 months and really um, whether it is a long term strategy. And of course, the two are related, but I, I think that its reception might have been better if it was a bit clearer about exactly exactly what it, it was addressing. And I think using the current uh, food price uh, increases as an excuse not to work on, uh, not to do more on obesity is an example of the unhelpful con conflation. And I think that will lead it to be criticized. Great. Um, let's pick up on that that point about long term term strategy because um, and as you're right you're right of course I mean while we're in a period of very steep inflation at the moment I think 
the forecasts appear to be that we should be expecting food price volatility into the future in the context of climate, increased frequency of, of climate shocks. Um, so getting ourselves fit for that future is starts now in many ways. Um, uh, and I think this point about the long term strategy and the comparison to the independent review, what one of the perhaps duller, but in our view, extremely important recommendations that were in was in the independent review was for a, a good food bill that would allow us to have that legislative infrastructure, which would allow policy development to take place over a long time period and survive successive governments. And uh, you know, a, a good food bill that sets out perhaps those very goals which are written into this document in a way which allows them to be tracked and for progress to be, be reported to parliament periodically and to be reviewed and discussed. And also to create a vehicle for, as you said, some of the, uh, well, I don't know if you use this word, but the enforcement of some of the commitments which are already in there, which at the moment feel rather flaky and that could kind of fall away under any pressure going forward. Um, and that to me feels like a really very significant omission um, from, from, and as you say, makes it feel a little bit more like um, a sort of more ad hoc list of commitments which aren't really embedded in that long-term agenda for change. Um, I mean, if I can just come in there, um, the, you will remember from your past life as a civil servant uh, just how much government does does not like to be constrained, especially by external bodies and such. And setting up the Climate Change Committee, however many years ago that was now, was really quite exceptional. So I, although I completely agree that it would be the right thing to do, I always thought that was probably going to be the last thing that the government would agree to. Um, if one... And I, 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 I very much hope I'm wrong with what I'm about to say, but if we are going to see some of the greatest problems and greatest crises around food prices, and especially among uh, lower income groups, there might just be an opportunity to revisit this in the next year or the next 18 months, just when it becomes really apparent how important food is. You know, in the jar, in the wonky garden, there might an Overton window might open for policy to be uh, to be developed there. So I agree, it would be good. I always thought that was going to be a very difficult thing for for government to accept. Are you talking specifically about the a body or a bill more generally, because I think the body question is, I mean, uh, uh, in the review, it's recommended that the. Food Standards Agency have that role to avoid a situation of creating a I, 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 I'm going to interrupt. You're cutting out a bit there. I wonder if you can just go nearer your microphone. Yeah, sorry, is that better? I'm that is better. Zooming right in here. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was, I was interested in whether your point there related specifically to a body and the challenges which there is to government to creating a separate body versus a bill uh, which would have a broader, you know, a broader purpose, if you like, beyond sort of independent tracking of progress. I think in, in the independent review, Henry recommended that the Food Standards Agency do the independent reporting of, of progress, which was a deliberate decision because of the point that you made, that it's extremely difficult for government to set up new structures and, uh, and, government typically doesn't like its homework being marked, um, so to speak. Um, what do you think? Do you think a bill is also a pretty uh, difficult thing to ultimately achieve here? Well, a bill could be many things. And um, it, again, it depends what's in it. Um, I like the idea of giving the FSA, the Food Standards Agency, more powers. And there is some words in the, um, in the current document about a body that will independently monitor at least some aspects of the food system. Um, I think that the strength we have with the Climate Change Committee is that it does have um, a legislative mandate. And when you have that, that just puts it in a completely different league. There is much more um, jeopardy for government 
um, the possibility of judicial reviews and, and things like that. So I think it would have been great to have that. Um, I always thought that would be hard. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, in the draft, one of the, the good little kernels was uh, that reporting would be brought together across the Food Standards Agency, the Office for Environmental Protection and the Climate Change Committee. And that feels like a good step in terms mm. of making some of those connections across government reporting. Um, you talked a bit about, uh, um, I mean, let, uh, let, perhaps we just wrap up this, this, this sort of line of questioning around how it reflects the independent review. And I think, um, We've done a quick assessment. We reckon four out of the 14 recommendations that were in the second of Henry's report uh, appear here uh, or, or have appeared in the levelling up white paper or in other government commitments. And then perhaps a further six where there's really nothing at all and the remaining are partially covered in different ways um, through sort of partial steps. Um, but maybe we should just move on to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, what you see as the kind of big gaps, and then we'll move on to the, the big ticks. So the, the biggest gap, I think, is that the sense of urgency and importance that the Dimbleby Report, National Food Strategy, the independent report had, has not been communicated. So I think the report really did very clearly articulate some of the um, uh, uh, challenges coming down, down the line, certainly around net zero, but also around the uh, other land-based commitments we are, we, we are making, net zero, for example, the need to protect much more of our peatland. And then on the consumer side, just the inexorable rise of, um, of uh, diseases associated with poor, poor diets. So that just didn't communicate, didn't transfer into, into, uh, into the response. Um, and on the environment where we just have to do a lot at the moment because of coming out of the European community, uh, whatever you thought about Brexit, there is the opportunity to actually craft a, a, a replacement for the CAP that produces multiple goods, uh, multiple benefits for, for this, for, uh, um, the country. And to me, that was one of the greatest uh, disappointments that that wasn't clearly uh, developed. Um, the document that came out of DEFRA and uh, in the times when Michael Gove was Secretary of State, uh, a really interesting document called Health and Harmony, a, a rather unusual title, but once you got beyond the uh, title, a really interesting document. And that had a adventurous and brave version, a, a view, vision rather, of how we were going to support our rural communities. In a high wage economy, we do have to put money into our rural communities somehow. And it had the mantra of public money for public good. And to me, it is a great shame that has been lost. Again, I think there's an element of timidity there. I would like to have seen that uh, retained and then to have a really interesting discussion about what is actually meant by a public good. And I think that there has been a little bit of that. Some of it has been, I think, fairly ill-informed. I think Theresa May was trapped into saying food is a public good. Well, food is good for the public, but technically it's not a public good. But there are all sorts of other things that, um, such as vibrant rural communities, which may or may not be a public good. So I would have liked to see much more of that. Um, I have enormous sympathies for the farming community at the moment who really have no idea how ELMS, which is a program that's replacing CAP, at least in England and their equivalent, body, uh, equivalent plans in the devolved administration, uh, devolved administration. But at least in England, it's very hard to see how that will evolve more than a couple of years ahead. And the industry, the sector is calling out for forward guidance there. And again, I think this is a little bit of timidity in that they're not saying what that is. And that was one of the recommendations in the, in the independent uh, uh, report that hasn't been taken a, a, across at all. Just to pick up on your point, because you, you talked a bit about, you know, timidity, and you've also said perhaps the current crisis will actually- Anna, forgive me, you're breaking up again. 
Um, I was going to put my headphones in. Hopefully that's better. That is better. Mm -hmm. um, the um, you talked a bit about timidity and the, uh, the perhaps that the fact that in the coming months as the pressures increase on families that it actually might trigger a new opportunity for leadership. Um, I think this is quite an important point because I think in my view the this whole process has really lacked a, a genuine political champion that is thinking about the food system and its multiple outcomes, whether they are public health or environment or economy, and thinking about the system as a whole and how we reorient it. Um, I mean, yeah, they, I, I mean, I, I, and I, I guess it's impossible to read the runes on the politics at the moment, obviously. <laughs> but um, I, I'm trying to imagine a, a, set, a circumstance where we might, that political leadership might genuinely emerge. And I mean, is your view then that the cost of living crisis and the impacts that that's going to have, a knock on impacts that that could indeed trigger that? Yes, uh, I guess sort of on the purely political side, there are a couple of strands at the moment. And one is that there is a, um, a debate along the lines about the degree to which the state should intervene in things such as the food system. And I think right at the moment, um, the uh, pendulum has swung within the Conservative Party, within the government party, uh, really quite firmly towards not, not intervening. Whereas mm -hmm. if one went back even sort of uh, 18 months ago, two years ago, in the middle of the pandemic, when the prime minister made some um, some of the announcements we talked about earlier on the beastie, it went the other direction. So I think, interestingly, as we and again, this is one of the uh, statements where I hope I'm wrong, but if we are going to see a real cost of living crunch over the next uh, twelve months, then that might push the um, the uh, pendulum back. You're talking about political leadership, then I think one of the problems is that we don't have a, well, there is no one with a convincing narrative about how the state should or should not intervene mm. within mm. the food system. It is ironic because within the food system, especially the agricultural sector, for very good reasons, it's the, um, the sector of the economy in which the state intervenes most. Yeah. And you can have people who simultaneously support the CAP and equivalents such as CAP, but then wants the state to get out of, uh, 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 get out of other parts. So um, there, to use a cliche, there is a happy medium there, but there is no one, I think, with a very clear narrative of how in the policy world to, uh, to go through that. And I, I have to say that I, I was disappointed in the report by the continued emphasis on, um, on empowering individuals to do the right thing, where we know that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and it does point things in the right direction, it pushes things in the right direction, but there is now a substantial evidence base that just relying on the consumer to do all the heavy lifting will not bring about the changes at scale that we need to do to have a food system that's environmentally sustainable and healthy. Yeah, you're right. And I think, I mean, there was a bit of nodding towards Henry's uh, description of the junk food cycle and the extent to which that really does trap people in um, a set of behaviours which ultimately are, are bad for their health. Um, and uh, the importance of um, intervening in the environment and the system to help people get out of that junk food cycle rather than um, putting all the onus on individuals. There's a nod to it, and I, but I, I, I don't think at the moment really the draft fully endorses that concept. Uh, it's a step in the right direction again, but um, perhaps not getting the whole way there. I mean, I think the other, the other gap feels like a very, very obvious gap, um, and it's been picked up by the media in the last couple of days, has been around the free school meals recommendation, which seems to me um, in the context of the cost of living crisis and the potential multiple benefits which free school meals can bring to 
children, families, schools, communities, um, and potentially to farmers if you do, if you set it up right in terms of procurement, um, that that feels like a, a huge, yeah, I mean, own goal really. I mean, particularly in the context of looking at Scotland and Wales both moving fast towards you know universal provision of free school meals in primary school um it feels like England is a a very notable outlier there um let's move on to some of the ticks I, I'm going to kick this off um I was actually I, I was thinking reading it thing, thinking what's going to be said about meat and I think it was reasonably cleverly handled um with a combination of the land use strategy, uh, as you said, or the, the yeah, the land use strategy, which is is was being proposed, the um, alternative protein kind of investment, and a little bit around R and D in that area, and then you know a really big push on horticulture from both a kind of tech as well as a sort of broader strategy and labour and productivity kind of angle, um, all of which felt like it wasn't sort of calling out the meat problem but it was starting to shift the conversation in in favor of sort of a bit of meat reduction I suppose and I'd be interested to know your thoughts on that the other thing that felt like a big tick to me is the mandatory business reporting which we see as being really in and of itself not well you know going to change the world but but unlocks potential for greater transparency and better policy development and a sort of ecosystem of moving the food industry in the right direction. But, but what do you see as being some of the, the ticks? Well, actually, my ticks very much overlap with yours. Um, the first one, and it's a slightly wonky tick, is that I actually like the fact that the government talked about what the ambition, what the target should be for food production in, in the country. Oh, yeah and uh, which is essentially to maintain it at the level that it is. Now you could, sensible people can argue with this. You can argue that we have a deep corporate um, uh, biodiversity in this country and we should sac sacrifice food production to increase biodiversity. Other people can point to the fact that the world will need to produce somewhere between 30 and 60% more food by mid-century and we should be stepping up to, to do that. So I think that's an argument we can have ahead but I really like the fact that there was an argument there. I like the bit about horticulture. I like the bit about talking about agricultural productivity. I would have liked them to define productivity in a slightly more sophisticated way, taking it into account the environmental and health externalities. But I thought that was good. Um, I liked, as you did, um, investing in trying to reduce emissions from uh, from meat, the um, food additives and, and things like that. I, I guess the way I look at it though, it is that the problems are really complex, but they're so complex they're almost simple that one just has to make progress on all fronts simultaneously. And so leaving out the necessity that if we are serious about net zero, we are gonna have to, uh, we are gonna have to, um, consume less meat. And the Climate Change Committee are clear about that. Um, the Dimbleby report was clear about it. And the government have just, for understandable political reasons, done that. And I think the shame is that they're, again, going back to the issues about narrative, one could imagine an evolution of land use in this country, where actually the people who make their living from producing the livestock at the moment um, get at least some of their, well, first of all, we eat less but better meat so that they're getting greater um, rewards back mm -hmm. per, per kilogram. And then we're also paying them for, for uh, the other ecosystem services that they're uh, producing. So one can imagine a narrative which could be both very positive for um, the environment community and for the farming community, but there's no one out there making it. We're getting polarization, not quite as polarized as in the States, but polarization, uh, um, uh, but polarization nevertheless. Yes, uh, yes, I agree. Okay, well, we've come to the end of our half an hour. It's been hugely interesting talking to you, Charles. Thank you for your time. Everybody who's been listening, thank you for listening. And please do let us know if you found this session useful or if we, how we can improve it. Um, Overall, I think the executive summary is 
it's a baby step. Uh, we have um, some things to build on, but a lot of work to make them actually turn into something reality. And we're in desperate need of some really strong long term political leadership on this on this issue. Thank you all very much for joining and um, and look forward to connecting with you all again at some point soon. Many have a good evening. Thank you. Bye bye.